Okay, we've just been working with indefinite integrals, and so I'd like to give you some more examples of how to work with them. I think it'll really help just to put things into perspective. So again, indefinite integrals are things where you have no bounds. You know, don't forget that fact, so maybe I'll write it down again. So indefinite means no bounds. And I haven't yet shown you what is something with bounds, but we'll do those soon. Those have been the next couple of videos here. So if you have no bounds, uh, that means something like this. So we have an example. f of x is this, 2x cubed plus 2x plus 1. And the question is, what's the integral of f of x dx? So this is just the notation we would use. So because we have no bounds, uh, then what we can do is, well, we can just start working on it. So the integral of, and instead of f of x, I'm actually going to plug in what it is. So 2x cubed plus 2x plus 1. And all that, we're taking the integral of it, and then we do dx. Well, how do I actually do this? This is an indefinite integral, so that means I have to remember, uh, well, how do we deal with this? The first thing we can do is, well, we need to find the antiderivative. Remember, that's how we deal with these things right here. With an integral, we have to find, you know, what's a function? Uh, I have to find some sort of function that when I take its derivative, it gets me this. That's the idea here. So I need to find the antiderivative. That's the first step here. Okay, so find the antiderivative. And then I'm just going to add a plus c to it. That's all I have to do. So when we have indefinite integrals, well, step one is just find the antiderivative, and two, just add, you know, add just some constant c. Now, the reason I gave you this example, first of all, it's a fairly simplistic one. It's just something with polynomials, but it gives us a chance to see how do we deal with sort of, yeah, multiple things going on. And it's actually pretty straightforward. Just have to remember this trick here. Remember that if we had um, x to the n, the antiderivative of that is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. That's the trick we're going to have to use. Okay, so this is the function. This is its antiderivative. So if we actually work on this one then, we can say then that uh, the integral is going to be, well, let's see, we need the antiderivative. So 2x cubed, we're going to use this trick here. So we have 2x cubed, so it has to be 2x to the power of 3. Now the 2 just hangs out here. So 2 is just there, it's a constant, it doesn't do much. So we say x to the power of, and we have to go one more than that, so that becomes 4 over 4. So that's the first part. Now the good news is, this is the same thing, uh, this is, this is uh, something actually pretty cool, is that this, we can actually say it's like this. We can split this up into a whole bunch of different small little integrals. So we could say it's the same thing as the integral of 2x dx plus the integral of 1 dx. So that's actually the same thing. In other words, we can split it up into three little integrals. So we do this little piece here, then we can deal with just this, and then we can deal with just this. So I've just dealt with the first one, it gave me that. The second one, 2x to the power of, well, it's like a little one here. Using the same trick, the two stays the same, it goes x, but instead of being to the power of one, it has to be one more, so it has to be two. And I always divide by that same number, so divide it by two. Plus, now here I have the integral. This is a little bit complicated looking, or at least the first time you see this, maybe it's not so simple. This could be seen as x to the power of zero, because anything to the power of zero is one. If that's the case, if, if you rewrote one as just one times x to the zero, then it should be more apparent what to do here. It would be a one times x to the power of, and this time it was a zero, so now it has to go up by one, so it'll be x to the one over one. In other words, it would be just 1 times x. That may not be so apparent. But basically, I've just now found the antiderivative, and now I just have to add c, and I'm done. So you can always check that you've done it correctly. Uh, actually, hold on a second. What I should do, before saying I'm done, I should probably reduce this a little bit. So 2 over 4, that gives me 1 over 2. So it's x to the fourth over 2 plus, now this 2 over 2, that cancels out. There we go. Now this is what's pretty cool is that this, you might wonder, well, why do I only have one C? Because shouldn't this have been, you know, two X to the fourth over four plus C, and this right here plus C, and this right here plus C? Shouldn't I then say three C? 
And this is why this is actually really super cheap because you can combine all those constants to make one big sort of super constant. And it, it sounds really cheap, but this is exactly how you can do it. You can totally do it this way and just have one big giant constant that takes care of all the different ones that you had. So because you don't know what it is, you just make it one big sort of super C, so to speak. And so that's how you can get away with it. So this right here, this would be what the uh, antiderivative is. Okay, so that's just because we said it was, yeah, we started off with 2x cubed, so it became 2x to the fourth over 4 plus 2x squared over 2. And that's because this thing here like this. Basically, the whole idea was we were trying to use this and finding an antiderivative. So that was the key here. So even though we were asked to do an integral, what we really did is step one, find the antiderivative, and then just add c to it. Let's see, haha, another example. So this time it looks different, but it's actually asking for the same type of thing. We're given dy dx. In other words, we're given that the derivative equals this mess. We want to know the original function. And how do you start with a derivative and find the original function? Well, you take the integral. In other words, you find the antiderivative. So we're, in, we're doing the exact same thing. I just wanted to show you different examples that look like they're different. Right here I said, here's f of x, find the integral. In this question I say, here's the derivative, find the original. But you do the exact same thing. Step one, find antiderivative. Step two, add some constant c. That's all we have to do here. So what's the antiderivative of this big mess? Well, we're going to deal with it individually. Okay, So we know that dy dx, I'm just going to rewrite it here. So we have 2 sine x minus 3e to the x plus, now this isn't very calculus friendly, a square root doesn't look very nice. Well, actually it looks nice, but it's not very easy to work with, with calculus. So if you remember what we were doing with derivatives, I can rewrite the original as x to the power of 1 half. That's the same thing as a square root. This may look ugly, but it's much more calculus friendly. So, I'm ready to deal with this, and I'm going to deal with the antiderivative Okay, that's going to basically get me, that's going to get me y equals. So that's going to get me my equation here. So I need to just now find the antiderivative. I'm going to deal with the first one. So you have to remember then what the antiderivative of sine is. Okay, so the antiderivative of sine is actually negative cos. Actually, these are some of the ones we're going to need. We were working with these before. So if we had f of x, you now I gave you a list before of integral of f of x dx. And we had, if it was x to the n, it became x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1, plus c, of course. If we had e to the x, it was just e to the x plus c. Uh, what else did we have? Um, well, if we had sine x, and we also had cos x. We had a few others, but these are the only ones that matter here. So if we have sine x, it actually is negative cos x, and cos is just sine. These are the ones we're going to use. We're going to sort of use these properties here. So which of these properties can I use? Well, there's a 2 hanging out, so there's still a 2 hanging out. But I need to deal with sine x. So what's the antiderivative of sine x? Well, the antiderivative is this, so minus cos x. So I'm going to say cos x here. And I have to remember to put a little minus in front. So maybe I'll just move this. So I'll just say minus. So I've dealt with this one. Of course, there's a plus c. Remember, I'm just going to add a plus c at the end, and it'll account for all of them. So I've dealt with the first term. Let's deal with the second term. This is a minus 3 e to the x. So the minus 3 just hangs out. And the integral of e to the x is, let's see, e to the x. So I'm using the word integral and antiderivative uh, interchangeably, which isn't exactly correct. But uh, when I do e to the x, I want to find the antiderivative, which is e to the x. So that's easy, actually. It's just this. That's the easiest one ever. And then I have x to the 1 half. That's something to a power. So what do I have to do there? Well, I have to add 1 to it. What's 1 half plus 1? That's like saying 1 half plus 2 halves. So that's 3 halves. So it's x to the 3 halves divided by, don't forget, to divide by the same number. So divided by 3 halves. And then don't forget, then you have to add the c. That's an important thing. Well, I'm almost done. All I have to do is just pretty it up a little bit. So I'm just going to deal with this thing right here. So I'll just rewrite the first part. So minus 2 cos x minus 3 e to the x plus, 
I could actually just leave it as x to the 3 halves. But what I could do here is when you divide by a fraction, you can always multiply by the reciprocal, which means what I can do here, I just want to make myself a bit more space, I can multiply by 2 over 3. It's the same thing as dividing by 3 over 2. So that's just the same. So there we go. There's my equation for y. Now why did I add the c? Ha ha ha, get it, y. No, the reason why I have the c here is because I could... Well, remember, the whole reason behind this whole thing here is that you can always check if you've done it right by just taking the derivative of your original. And the derivative of your original should give you... Sorry, not your... Yeah. The derivative of this should give me this. It better if I did it right. So you can always check if you've done it right. Same thing over here. The derivative of this had better be this. Right? That's how it works here. It should, it should definitely always work that way. So we can always check that we've done it right. And if I did the derivative, the reason why I can see that I have a plus c, well, because if I do the derivative of this, the plus c, well, it just goes poof. It disappears. So that means the only thing I have to deal with is this. So this, again, was another example of an indefinite integral in a sense, because I started with the derivative and I wanted to find the original sort of starting function. So we did that by finding, you know, what, what function has a derivative of this? And it turns out this has a derivative of this. So you see, that's how we can deal with some of these examples here. So these are fairly simplistic integrals, even though they may look really ugly. But these are simplistic integrals. In the next video, I'm going to show you a little bit more complicated, but we'll see how we can easily deal with it. There's just a few little tricks.